thing titled Making Online Events Accessible. We're very happy to be here today. My name is Kate Moeller. I teach English at Mesa Community College, and I serve as president of Ability Maricopa. I have long brown hair. I am wearing a, a black and gray t-shirt with white moons on the front. And I am a slightly older than middle-aged white woman. And I will pass to Jason. Hello, everybody. My name is Jason Rich. I am currently the co-president for staff representation. I'm on a two-year reassignment. Um, my permanent position is as a senior software developer in the instructional media and accessibility team at Rio Salado. Um, I am a middle-aged white gentleman with a uh, mustache and goatee and long brown hair, and I'm wearing a black button-up shirt. Stephen. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Stephen Crawford. I'm the district director for the Maricopa Center for Learning and Innovation out of the district office, and I am a 50-ish white male with short grayish hair and a long white beard wearing his Maricopa Community College's polo. Thank you very much. Well, let's say a few words about why we are here today. Our district offers many events every year to students, employees, and the larger community. Many are virtual, enabling everyone to attend from various locations to acquire extra credit, CE units, professional growth, or enrichment. However, some virtual offerings are not as inclusive or robust as they could be, and in-person events do not serve employees with remote schedules, online-only ADA accommodations, and other situational restraints. A digital first approach makes all events more inclusive and accessible. So while face-to-face -face events are valuable, they don't serve everyone. So we are promoting a digital first mindset to be most inclusive. So, when you think about uh, universal design, you think about how we can help people. And if you consider this, this is why this digital first mindset is so important. When curb cuts were invented, they were not meant for, quote, everybody. It was meant to help people with wheelchairs and people with uh, vision issues who could not see the curb and might actually and might trip. So it was to increase the mobility for, for those individuals. But the impact of that design was that it helped everyone and it made it convenient for everyone. And so that is what we are looking to do for, uh, for uh, having this digital first mindset. We're looking to create basically a curb cut to our FPG events so that it benefits everyone. So let's talk about why accessibility matters. Uh, the easy answer is legal compliance. We can start with the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'm not gonna go too much into that now, but I, we will talk about that a little bit more later on. Also, another consideration are ethical considerations. Inclusivity is a core value of the district. And so therefore we want to make sure that when we are creating a program, we're creating an event, we're creating a webinar, we would like to include as many people as possible in the participation. By doing that, that also gives us the ability to have diverse perspectives. By having a robust participation from, our, uh, from people who are participating in these events, they are able to enhance our events because we're able to get that diverse perspective. Also, there's some practical benefits to consider. From a fiscal responsibility standpoint, this reduces travel costs. When you consider an event that might be occurring at Phoenix College, that could require people to drive an hour from places like Australia Mountain or Chandler Gilbert just to get there. 
That means they could potentially be out of the classroom or out of the office for three or more hours for a one hour event, one hour to get there, one hour to participate and one hour to go back. It also uh, helps with health and safety, minimizing risks specifically. You know, we remember during the pandemic, we had to have uh, limited numbers of people in a room because of the potential of people getting sick. But COVID's not the only thing we need to be concerned about. You can spread colds and flus and therefore take people out of the office uh, and having reducing productivity from that standpoint. You could also take those sick illnesses home and pass them around to your family, to senior citizens or young people who may not be as have a robust immune system. So this is a great way to minimize risks for health and safety. Also flexibility, accommodating last minute challenges and our changes. And this is a great one for me uh, I, as I think about what MCLI does. We have an event uh, for residential and adjunct faculty called the District Day of Learning at the beginning of the January uh, return of the contracts. Many faculty are returning from, from uh, winter vacation where they may have gotten sick and brought germs home with them. They may have had delayed travel uh, situations where now they're not as ready to be somewhere in person. Now they have that flexibility to participate in an online uh, environment and be able to fully participate uh, in what everyone else is doing. Like there, there are many uh, reasons, many good reasons, and these are just some of them. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Jason to talk about why this matters. So we know we have a lot of um, realities inside of our district. Um, we, we know we're short staffed. We have a lot of teams that just do not have the availability to have somebody leave for a day. Um, it could cause a department not to be able to function. You have limited people to work in those departments. Um, but by allowing them to attend virtually, they can still man counters, back people up, step away if they really have to. Um, and we know that right now, the district is having multiple different things coming from different angles that are impacting us financially, really requiring us to start looking at how we can reduce our budgets and uh, bring costs down. Uh, as well as employees call out sick, you may have had every intention to go, but then all of a sudden employees out sick, now you're stuck. Um, and we know that it takes a long time to fill our positions. So this is always a, um, a constant struggle we're having is keeping enough staff and locations in order to, to be able to support people going to events. Um, as well, the district has a very distributed staff. Um, counting just last week, we have over 35 owned locations. That includes our main campuses, our satellite campuses, our um, auxiliary support uh, buildings, such as where we, we host um, our surplus. When you bring all those together, we have staff that are so spread out that one of the only ways you can guarantee to get everybody in is by providing a virtual option. Uh, as well as that doesn't include all the embedded staff we have at high schools, prisons, West Mech, uh, and all of our other partners. Um, so when you really think about it, we are, we are extremely um, segregated across the district. And if we really want to get an opportunity to get all of those people involved, then um, in person quite often doesn't provide that opportunity. As well as like Stephen already said, that it, it can, uh, there's an expense to that when you're trying to get a couple hundred people to all come to an event and it may be an hour of travel both directions. That's a lot of gas, it's a lot of travel time. That's time they're spending not doing other work. Um, that's salary hours we have to pay and that's loss of production that they're able uh, able to do because of that time they're taken away. And a real reality that a lot of people are facing now is back-to-back -back meetings. If you have one meeting at one campus, you may not physically be able to get from that one campus to the other. So virtual um, helps lessen the, the load of those back-to-back -back meetings. And it really helps guarantee you have more voices and more ears when you're trying to um, gather feedback and share information. Thank you, Jason. So why might people be excluded? There are so many reasons. Some reasons are obvious. So we call these observable disabilities. You know, if, if someone is blind, obviously that person will not be driving 
hopefully not be driving to your event. Um, and there, you know, people have all kinds of physical maladies that prevent them from getting into a car easily, tra you know, traversing the land and, and getting to a physical location. There's a lot involved if you're not able-bodied. So observable disabilities can end up excluding people from attending a face-to-face -face event. Then there are so many hidden disabilities that prevent people from fully participating in a face-to-face in-person meetings. Um, one of those or a category would be mental illnesses. And for this, I'll use myself as an example. I have bipolar disorder and I have an online only accommodation for that because taking care of me is a big job and make keeping me productive is, you know, takes some, um, it takes some care and it takes some caution. So I stick to a schedule and I make sure that I do all the healthy things that a person with bipolar disorder should be doing to keep themselves, um, you know, productive and healthy. So I'm very schedule oriented. And sometimes, you know, if something is face to face and it's way across the world, that that's really hard for me to to make it there. Um, also, there are so many people with sensory um, sensitivities um, and they don't feel all that comfortable in large crowds. Uh, over noise can be overwhelming. Um, there, there are all kinds of reasons that are unobservable that prevent people from fully participating and engaging in face-to-face -face offerings. Of course, there are emergencies. We all experience those. You know, we get stuck in our offices, you know, maybe, you know, that the administrative assistant is out, so somebody has to sit at the front desk. You know, there's always things like that going on um, that prevent us from attending face-to-face -face when we had planned to. Um, allyship and privacy con misconceptions. I like to talk about this because as a person with bipolar disorder and having had an online accommodation for eight years, I have heard all kinds of reasons given for why an event can't be offered online or cannot have a virtual component. Often I hear, well, um, we want to build allyship, so you need to be here to do that. Um, but really that's not true because, you know, whole relationships take place online. Uh, we all know that. Um, so it, I don't think, you know, online attendance doesn't discount the value of, of the attendee. Um, and privacy, you know, we, as we all know, you know, if we all get together in person, of course, we're going to talk and, and see what's going on. Um, and it's the same if you attend online, um, you know, everyone there, there's, there's nothing special about an in-person event that prevents it from being private or, or to build solidarity. So these are just reasons that people give um, for not having planned an online component or not, not having the money to do it, not having the, the number of people you need to facilitate it. These are also reasons given for excluding online participants. Um, bias towards remote workers or those with flexible schedules. I, I'm very familiar with that. I have had an online only accommodation for eight years and I know that, that people are envious of that. You know, or people look down on, on me for having that because they think I'm getting special treatment. And I always say to people like that, well, try having bipolar disorder 24 seven and, you know, try to manage that. And it's, you know, it's definitely a trade off and, and I totally benefit as do all people with remote accommodations from being able to attend virtually. And I like to think that I bring to the party a new voice, you know, something a little different because 
I have my own work experience to share. So we're going to take a look at Haben Gurma. Haben Gurma is a deaf blind graduate of Harvard University. Haben was the keynote speaker at the first ADA conference I attended. And I was so taken by her. I was so impressed by her. And you know what? It didn't matter a bit that she was coming to us virtually. She was online. We were all in the room and it was like Haben was there. So I hope you find Haben as inspiring as, as I do when you look at this clip. The biggest challenge in schools, medical centers, workplaces is ableism. Ableism is the system of belief that treats disabled people as inferior to non-disabled people. When I arrived in college, I discovered the menus in the cafeteria were only in print. I couldn't read it, not because of blindness, but because of the format of the menu. The idea of disabled people going to university still surprises some people who work at schools. And that's a classic example of ableism. We need to plan for disabled students. I went to the manager and I told him, the format of the menu doesn't work, but if you provide it in Braille or post it online or email it to me, I have tech that allows me to read emails and websites that are accessible. The manager said, we're very busy. We don't have time to do special things for students with special needs. Just to be clear, eating is not a special need. <laughs> There's this myth that non-disabled people don't need help but non-disabled people need lots of accommodations. The cafeteria was full of chairs, hundreds of chairs. Those are accommodations for non-disabled students. Students with wheelchairs roll in with their own chairs. So the school was spending money on accommodations for non-disabled students. <laughs> And along the ceiling, there were lights. Those are accommodations for sighted students. Blind students didn't need the lights. In fact, the school would have saved so much money if they turned off the lights. The difference between accommodations for disabled people and non-disabled people is ableism. And if we learn to notice ableism, we can remove it from our schools. But back then, I didn't know that. I didn't know how to advocate. So I was stuck not having access to the menu. I told myself, don't complain. There are worse things in the world. It's just menus. And the barrier followed me day after day. One day, I did research, and I learned about ADA.gov. I learned about the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I realized we have rights. The Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities, including students. And I went back to the manager and I told him, if you don't provide access to the menu, I'm going to take legal action. <laughs> I had no idea how to do that. <laughs> I was 19, I couldn't afford a lawyer. Now I know there are nonprofit legal centers like DRC, where Eric works. Within the government, there's the US Department of Justice, Office for Civil Rights, where we can send in complaints. There's the US Department of Education, Office for Civil Rights. So we have all these resources, but I didn't know about them. All I knew was I had to try, I had to do something. The next day, the manager apologized. He was scared of getting sued. <laughs> and the culture changed at the cafeteria. Instead of thinking of it as something extra and charity, they realized they must provide accessibility. The ADA helps us fight ableism 
and I hope more people learn about the resources, our laws, the agencies that can help us to fight ableism and discrimination. Thank you. That's awesome. The I hope you enjoyed. The biggest challenge in schools, medical. I hope you enjoyed Hobbin. Hobbin Gurma is my hero. She doesn't like to be told no, and neither do I. Our next slide has a an illustration um, of the difference between equality, accommodation, and accessibility. The first picture shows a man who is short, a woman who is tall, and a young person in a wheelchair. And they're all trying to write on a board that's located high, high on the wall. So it's, it's out of reach for a couple of those people, even though they all have, you know, markers and they can all reach up, they can't reach the board. If you look at the accommodation example, you see that accommodations have been made by who's ever in charge of this classroom. Um, the short man has a box to stand on and the person in the wheelchair has been given a ramp to reach the board. So now they can all write on it. However, an even better, more inclusive idea a more creative option is to move the board, move the board down so that everyone can access it. So this illustration, in, it shows us how important it is to anticipate people's needs. We want to be thinking, thinking ahead. We want to, you know, imagine all the people who are going to be wanting to attend. How can we best serve them? How can we reimagine what we what we used to do and how we've always done it to make it more inclusive so that more people can participate? That's the idea here. I'm going to share for a minute. Um, Microsoft has a bunch of people that are get dedicated to designing products for people with with disabilities, um, and that group has created what they call. Um, inclusive uh, design toolkit. So in this, they really try to help people understand how to support people by putting yourself in a situation. So what they try to show is that you may have somebody who's lost an arm and now they've lost all sense of touch from that hand, but you could just as easily fall and break your arm or be holding a, a, a child and lose access to that arm. So how would you do that, do something if you had lost access to your arm for whatever reason. And so they say the same thing, like when you're talking about sight, yes, there are going to be some people that are just blind, um, but you may have gone into the eye doctor and had your eyes dilated. Now you can't see normal, um, or you may not be able to look at everything because you're driving. Uh, these are just ways, they're called personas, where you put yourself in the mind of, if you were having a particular struggle, how would you solve it? And so a lot of times when we're, when we're planning for designing something for everybody, we'll try to step into these different personas. If I couldn't touch my mouse, how would I navigate this? If I couldn't see the screen, how would I get the information that's on there? Um, so when you might have a blind person in the room, you just think if I'm trying to share this on a radio station, how might I describe that? How might I... Um, try and get that through. How have I heard other people on the radio describe it? So these are just methods that you can use to work through how you would want to see things so that you can then apply that to how you design your 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 um, events. So let's talk about some of the basic steps you can take for making your event more accessible and inclusive. And that goes back to this idea of a digital first mindset. So at MCLI, when we do events, we think about how do we do this digitally first? And, and we get a really nice benefit that I don't think people quite realize that I'm going to talk about here in a moment. Uh, but first, that digital first mindset. 
we think about where can we host this event where we can have quality audio, where the speakers all have a microphone on them, either a lavalier mic or they're at a regular stick microphone. Um, we think that's very important for having panels with multiple speakers. Everyone needs to have a microphone so they all can be heard. That is fantastic for the people in the room as well as remote because sometimes it can be hard to hear within the room. We think about the, the, uh, the displays. What are we going to be putting up as a slide deck? Can we distribute that ahead of time? Sometimes when you're bringing in outside speakers, that is not always possible. But when it is possible, you definitely want to do that. You also want to provide those slides at least afterwards uh, so that someone can look at it. But it's better to have that ahead of time. It's also really important about thinking about how, how are things progressing? How do you make this work? So you got to make sure you have time for your tech team to be able to swap out between a panel and a keynote speaker. You got to consider questions. How do I handle questions from the audience? And so one of the things we'd like to do is have a QR code or a short link, probably both. And that way the audience is asking questions via a Google form the same way the digital audience is. This way, all the questions go to one location and then you have a facilitator who can then just pick out the best questions, or if four or five people are asking the same question, group them together and ask them out. What's really nice about this is you now reduce the risk of someone taking over a house microphone and providing a five minute preamble before asking their question and therefore taking the entire Q and A uh, period for their own mini presentation. Uh, so this way you can help get that in, you know, you can kind of keep things focused and moving the program along. By having a, a video team, a lot, you know, it's not, it's more than just putting a camera in the back of the room, aiming it to the front and just capturing the entire room. If you can have someone who's manning the camera and zooming in on the speaker, someone who's switching between the PowerPoint and the speaker, because there's a lot of times as a speaker, we talk and we talk and we talk, and it's somewhat related to the PowerPoint, but if you leave the PowerPoint up for five minutes of the, on that one slide where the person's talking, that's not really exciting for the remote audience. But if you can switch back to the speaker and then switch back to the PowerPoint as appropriate, you're now creating a better program. And what's nice about this is now you have a video recording afterwards that you can reuse in other contexts. What's really been fascinating over the years as MCI has been doing this more and more is, it, is that we have had people who have asked to use selections of our recordings for different training sessions because they really appreciated what was said and wanted to reuse it. Now, you may have to make sure you have the correct permissions before you do that, but it's an option that you would not have if you didn't have a digital first mindset. Because without that digital first mindset, we all just walk in a room, we do a thing and we walk out and that's the end of it. This way, these sessions can last longer. It's one of the reasons why this session is being recorded. It will be used in other venues to share with other people who may not have been available now to participate. So these are some ways to do that by having chat managers who can run breakout rooms, who can run the tech behind the scenes. Those things are very valuable. So yes, you need a couple of extra people to participate but it can create a very rich, robust uh, event that is memorable by not just the people in the room, but by everyone. So we've, we've mentioned this a few times and it also came up in the video, but we want to take a quick overview of what ADA is. Um, quite often we see ADA um, with meaning a very general thing, um, but ADA is broken up into five pieces. Um, we're going to talk about the four that really kind of apply to us. Um, Title I covers employment. And so that's when we say you, you've gotten a, a job-related ADA accommodation. That means you've gone to your supervisor or HR, requested an accommodation. That all falls under Title I. And what this kind of says is if you have been given a job accommodation, it is now your um, supervisor's um, responsibility to make sure that anything that you're required to go to is covered. Um, so this would be like if, like for example, Kate's on on uh, remote accommodation, that if there's a meeting in her department that she has to be included on, that it has to be made virtual by default. 
because that is part of her accommodation. It's a known umbrella. Um, Title II is state and local governments. And as we are a public um, educational institution, that means that it also includes us. Um, so we, uh, the stuff that we do in an academic sense in the classroom all falls under Title II. Um, and Title II basically says that accommodations for, for the students have to be done on a per class basis. So you can design uh, using universal design to make your session available, but there's no way that you can solve every problem for every student. So the students have the ability to go to DRS, request for um, accommodation. DRS then helps find them the right accommodation, works with the faculty if required, works with the testing center if required, works with whoever to make sure that the accommodations are set up for the, for the students. Um, and then the teacher running the class would then have to work, uh, follow whatever guidance DRS provides them. Title three is really around public accommodations and commercial facilities. And this is really just making sure that when you go to a building that's been built since 1970, that it's wheelchair accessible. Um, but it also covers public events. So whenever you're like you're going to a concert and you're filling out to buying your ticket and asked you have an ADA accommodation, that's what they would call a title three accommodation. And so this is, you'll see quite often when we're gonna be sending out a event for a broad number of people, it may be done by the workplace, but it is not specifically related to your job. It doesn't fall under Title I, it falls under Title III. And in Title III, it says we must offer people a method to request accommodations for those, those public events. So you'll quite often see that when we're doing an internal event, we'll add that on there, and that's really trying to meet that Title III. Now, as an employee, if you're going to a work-offered event, you have an option. You can go through the Title III accommodations and request it from the event coordinators. Um, or if it's job related, you can go to your um, HR ADA coordinator and ask for them to assist you. And that turns it into a Title I um, accommodation request. So that's why some of our internal events may fall under both rules depending on how the employee requests the accommodation for it. Um, and Title IV is really the one that sets up that we have to have closed captioning um, on our videos. We have to have audio descriptions. Um, and audio descriptions is really just a voice describing the screen to the person. Uh, we find that for educational, um, having audio descriptions is extremely useful because a lot of times, even if you're visual, you're watching the video, it's something really complex. You may not know what's happening, but then by going and putting audio descriptions on, you're now having what's happening on the screen um, described to you. So we found that a lot of, of people, especially in the educational uh, re uh, realm, uh, can find additional value from audio descriptions even if they aren't blind. Um, but it also covers phones and kiosks and whatnot. So we wanna take a minute and talk about based on this, what is required versus what is aspirational. Um, first thing to remember is when ADA was written, it was written in, in 1970, and we didn't have virtual events. We didn't have all the different modalities that we have now. So it was really written around um, physical access to locations. So for the most part, the loss is really going you must make sure there's wheelchair accessibility. You must make sure there's an ASL interpreter if it's requested. You must make sure that um, there's a hearing assistance device if somebody needs it. Uh, and those are all um, around the facility. But a lot of the more recent laws that have been coming out and, and rules and adjustments are starting to make it to where we have to be up front with the digital. So now under Title II, uh, we have until 2026 to make sure all of our content is accessible before our students ask. So right now, as I described, they have to go and ask for the material to be to made accessible. In 2026, all of our material has to be accessible before the student asks for it. Um, as well, they're starting to make requirements for all um, all public websites that we produce must be accessible by default. That is already a current thing. If they're not, the students can um, students and the public. Um, have legal right to, to sue us. Um, and really, you, you need to make sure that when you are working with these groups that you know 
what your options are ahead of time that if you're doing uh, an event that's going to have people that have uh, hearing issues, you're probably going to need captioning. Um, if they ask for it, you, you have to be able to provide it. If you're going to have somebody who's, who's deaf, you, you're going to have sign language. Um, that if you're sending out flyers that are going to be made public, they're going to be sent outside of our system, that those flyers are accessible before they get sent out. Um, and that you, you need to communicate how they can request their accommodations um, and what accommodations you're providing is really highly suggested because then a lot of times it'll prevent people from requesting accommodations in the first place. Now, things that are aspirational is using a hands caption. So we know like this platform has an automatic captioning service. Um, if you have really um, crucial information with complex terms, quite often you might want to actually go and hire a captioner that can do it in real time that specializes in, so like you're doing a medical class, get somebody who understands medical terms and how to do them. And that really helps um, upgrade the quality of the captioning coming out. Um, offering training, we, we, we quite often suggest that people do um, practices up front or go to a training course to, to help get experience in it, but there's no legal requirement around that. Providing feedback mechanisms so how people can tell you afterwards um, there's no legal requirement to that, but quite often you can ask people what could have been better, and that'll give you lots of hints about how you can improve future events. Um, and really using uh, the universal design and inclusive design practices that are out there, um, by using them you can really uh, create a better product in the first place that'll benefit all, of, all users. So, uh, what we're suggesting that is um, considered when advertising events is, like I said, what planned accommodations you'll have. Um, quite often you say, I'm going to have an ASL interpreter there, then people are going to be like, oh, I don't even need to request that, it's already there. And that might actually attract some people who might not have considered that it was worth the time of making the request, but they'll see it's there and go, oh, it's already, already welcome to me, maybe I should be there. Um, make sure that you post your methods for requesting accommodations. Um, generally, that's just an extra field in the registration form, or it's a um, comment at the bottom of an announcement email that says, if you need an accommodation, reach out to this email address. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. Um, it just is saying, if you need an accommodation, here's how you let us know. Um, like I said, if you are pr uh, providing translation services, whether that be sign language, foreign languages, live transcriptions, it's good to let them know ahead of time. Um, Especially if you're like having foreign language translations that will let people know up ahead of time that, oh, this event is already tailored for me and I'll be able to participate. Try and keep all of the uh, announcements clear and simple. Um, you want people to be able to get as much out of the communication from first read as possible. Um, try to provide information in multiple formats. Um, so quite often you might, you know, go and put it in a newsletter, but then you might go to an event and announce it or produce a video that kind of teases it. But coming at it from multiple modalities will help uh, get more people informed. And uh, where possible, uh, share presentation materials beforehand. And this is really important when you're going to be like, oh, we're going to be reviewing an article uh, and then talking about it. If some people might be able to just open up the article and blast through it, others may need to be able to read the article, sleep on it and be, before they're able to really engage in a conversation. So we suggest sending presentation materials ahead of time. Um, the more material that is expected to be reviewed, the more we emphasize that so people have a time to digest the information and be prepared for the conversations that are happening. So whether you are presenting online or in person, here are some considerations for you. As Jason just said, to provide material ahead of time is very important. Um, as an instructor, I uh, always publish my classes early and, you know, make modules available to students who want to look ahead. It makes them feel more comfortable, more prepared. Um, describe presenters and content for visually impaired participants. You heard Stephen and Jason and I describe ourselves earlier. That sounds funny to some people, but we're doing that to be inclusive. Consider your words and language always, not just if you're presenting. Um, some of these words are derogatory, and I won't say some of them. 
But as a person with bipolar disorder, uh, I have certainly been um, in situations where the weather is called bipolar or, or a work situation is called bipolar and they're not really bipolar. Um, you might, you know, we do toss around the word crazy and insane, but uh, these words mean more to people who actually have cognitive dysfunction. So when you say, you know, like the word delusional, to be honest, you know, I've had delusions and they're very troubling, they're very upsetting. I have been manic, you know, in my, in my bipolar disorder. And it is, it's one of the worst things that has ever happened to me. So when people are using words that pertain to my mental health casually to make a joke, you know, that doesn't sit well with me all the time. Although, you know, I certainly have come to expect it, but we can do better. So let's do better when we can do better. Uh, the phrase, do you see what I mean? Is pretty self-explanatory especially if you're, you're speaking to someone who's blind. Um, metaphors, you know, I, I come across this a lot. You know, of course we all, we use metaphors as shorthand for what we really mean. And some of these, actually all of them are, they're not specific. They don't say what you mean. They are not inclusive. Um, in, in fact, they are exclusive because they're derogatory towards the people who they're being uh, used to describe. So I always, I advocate for saying what you mean. Use your own words, explain it, say it. Um, don't try to whitewash over it with a metaphor that might be insulting to someone and you don't even know it. Um, we forgot to say our gender pronoun preferences at the beginning, but we had good intentions and really having good intentions counts. Um, anticipating people's needs counts. You know, it, we don't, no one expects every event to be perfect and perfectly accessible. What we really want to do is change the culture so that we're all coming together evenly, you know, fairly and productively. Repeat questions and comments from the audience. Always appreciated. We always miss something. So we all are served with repetition. And finally, when wearing a mic, be aware of distracting noises and when your mic is on. Uh, I certainly have been in situations where people are clapping too close to the microphone and, and <clears throat> my ears are blowing up. So, just be cognizant of, of your self-presentation and your word choice when you're presenting. Okay. Um, some things we wanted to point out for, for creating visual materials, this, in, this includes any flyers, documents, um, slides. Uh, first is consider fonts. Um, there are specific fonts out there uh, that are made specifically for what's called hyper legibility. And, and really what that is, is for people who have dyslexia, they might have characters that get reversed. So by making characters that are visually similar, like B and D have distinct uniquenesses, it can help people with dyslexia be able to differentiate them. Um, as well, quite often you'll find fonts won't have very much difference between the the number one, the letter I, and the letter L. So if you look at the, the Cambry, you can see that the uppercase I is sh slightly shorter than the, than the lowercase L. Um, so it's very difficult to tell that those are actually different letters. But if you look at the examples above that, you can see that there's very distinct differences between each of the character shapes that help people be able to break them apart. Um, the ones we, we shared here are, are um, free open source fonts, um, but there are lots of other ones out there, like, for example, the one at the bottom, BBC um, uh, Wraith was made um, specifically by BBC for BBC, so not everybody can go and use it, but we, just, we showed that as a way of demonstrating the character differences. Um, avoid using all caps 
um, as all caps makes it hard to, um, for people to digest the messages and can potentially give a, um, a connotation of yelling. Um, keeps clear space around text in between lines. You don't want paragraphs butting up against each other because it'll make, hard, make it difficult for people to know where one line ends and another one begins. So the more space you can put between blocks of information is the better. Um, use large fonts as much as possible. If you're finding your fonts are getting smaller than 18 points on a slideshow, then you probably got too much information on a slide and you should consider breaking it up or um, slimming it down. Because um, you really want to make sure that there's opportunity on each slide for everybody to actually digest what's there. Um, So some other important considerations uh, is the reading order. And that is really when you're in um, products like P PDF, um, Photoshop, PageMaker, any of these products, you're just throwing objects on the, on the screen. And visually, we know you start at the top visual object and you move down. Well, people that are using products like screen readers, um, they don't see that visual representation. What they'll do is they'll tab, and the tab will take them from object to object on the page and read it to them the order it's in. So when we're talking about reading order, that's really what we're talking about, is, is to make sure that when somebody is going through the document that it's being read to them in the order you're intending it to be read. Um, Google Docs and Word Docs are great about this because they only have that top to bottom uh, understanding. But when you lots of times take something and like a a book page that has a size, and then you go and scan that into a scanner and have that converted back into text, it can take all those asides and just stick them right in the middle of the text because it doesn't understand that reading order. So we just really recommend before you send stuff out that you go and you test it to make sure that the stuff on the page is showing up in that, that order. Uh, the next is heading order. Screen readers actually will give people a multiple different ways to navigate a page. And one of the more popular ways is by providing a list of headers and then being allowed people to jump to them. Now, headers are not all the same. They come in um, heading one, heading two, heading three, and so on. And that's really meant to be um, a collapsing of those headers. So header two should be under header one, and header three should be under header two, and so on. And that allows them to more easily see an outline for how the document is put together. And so this brings us to what we call semantic design. And what that really is just saying is use the right object for what you're trying to do. If you're trying to make text bold, then make it bold. Um, if you're trying to create something that looks like a header, use a header. Um, don't just make the text um, uh, bold and larger than the other text because the screen reader will come in and they won't know that that's a header. They don't see that visual. So it's making sure that you're using the right element for it. It's more important when you get into web design, but think about that too. Is when you're putting headers in a document, make sure they're actually headers because then it allows screeners to navigate the document easier. Um, and like we were saying, accessible PDFs, you can make a PDF. By default, PDFs are meant to be photocopies so that you can send it to a print shop and they can print it out. Um, so when you're making an accessible PDF, not only does it have the photo of the flyer, but it also then has a text alternative baked in. Um, so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll send out flyers and you try and select the top and scroll down. If you're not able to select any of the text, it's not an accessible flyer. If you start at the bottom and you pull down and the selection is jumping all over the document, you know you don't have a good reading order. Um, but there's tools in Acrobat where you can go in, you can change that reading order, you can um, add alt text, you can remove things. And this brings us around to our questions and answers phase. Uh, we did have a question about the um, link for the sign-in form. Uh, we were only able to send the initial sign-in sign form during the first 15 minutes of the, the presentation. Uh, I believe, Steve, uh, you'll be sending out a closeout um, form as well. Okay. We have any other questions and answers in the group? I do have something to say, and I'll add that we've probably given you a lot to think about today. Uh, people who need accommodations and benefit from them, 
have also been doing a lot of thinking. We are sometimes lost. Sometimes we feel left out and sometimes we get frustrated, but we are also hopeful and thankful when our needs are anticipated. We hope we have left you inspired to be more aware of everyone's need, more aware of accessibility options, and more inclusive of everyone. We had a question from um, Chris Flowers. Chris, I'm going to unmute you so that you can speak if you'd like to ask that question. Because the question he had was, if we are having a class, will a camera be available for online? And I'd like to get a little bit more context with that. I think that really comes down to the classroom and the, the, the um, college. Um, each college has their own inventory, their own processes. Um, some some classrooms have built-in cameras, so it'll already be there. Um, most classrooms can have a camera and a, um, a laptop walked in. Uh, I know that uh, at Rio we did that for a lot of classes where we would we would roll in a camera and a microphone, hook it up to a laptop so that they could uh, bring students in. Uh, but let's also keep in mind some classrooms are in places where you know, they're really old rooms. They may not have a, a good access to the internet. They may not have good access to Wi-Fi. So it is possible some spaces just won't be able to handle it at all, but it really does come down to an individual college, reaching out to your, your technical support team to see if they can get a camera. Um, most schools have some cameras on stock for this kind of purpose. You can go and, and borrow one if they can't give you one or perm, uh, permanently. Yeah, and I'll add to that some as well. Um, a number of, of our colleges did use some of the uh, some of the pandemic dollars that we saw uh, her funds for upgrading classrooms. And I will also add that some colleges had more funds than others, so therefore they did a better job buying better equipment than others. But all because there's a camera in the room doesn't mean you're going to have a quality experience for your remote folks. So remember that that digital first mindset, because if all it is is a tiny little camera in the back of the room, like a bird sitting on the wall looking down, it may not be a great experience. So those are some things to keep in mind. Um, you're almost better off having someone who can take a webcam and aim it or move around as necessary. I will add that I have been accommodated by a person carrying a laptop many times. And I think it's beautiful when we can use what we have as resources to include people however we can. You know, even if that is propping a physical door open for more people to come in or uh, or having, you know, a laptop open to the Zoom meeting where everyone is so, you know, the person online can participate too. I know I have always been so appreciative of that. It's such a kindness, you know, accessibility and inclusion is a kindness. We, um, we've done them similar for a lot of events. What we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll generally get somebody in the room to be like, hey, can you be the, the laptop buddy? And then that way there's a dedicated person to move the laptop around to break out rooms, make sure the person feels included. Um, and like when you have one or two people coming in, we've quite often like two laptops, two buddies, and that seems to work pretty well. Um, another thing we'll, we'll do, especially if we have multiple people online, is we'll we'll see if we can get to one of the um, participants to be agree to be an online facilitator and facilitate the breakout conversations online, just like we're doing in the room. Um, so it's good to always like try and find somebody in the room who's willing to you know, sit next to the escape window on the airplane that's willing to be that person to help if the help uh, is needed. Um, that way you're not necessarily having to have extra facilitators, you're taking advantage of, of um, the extra support that's already in the room to, to help uh, mitigate those differences. In the chat, we've had some conversations about some of the high flex uh, rooms, something I'm I'm very fond of personally. And it's 
It's been really hard as, uh, as someone in the district office because we don't have access to all of the college's 25 lives. So we don't know what rooms you have. We don't know how they're equipped and we don't know what their availability is. So we're, we have to rely on our partners at those colleges to, to let us know and, and, and help us with that. It's one of the reasons why you see the governing board often using the bull pit at Phoenix College and me as well, because it is a resource where we know we have some quality cameras, some quality displays, some quality uh, uh, information like that. We also know Rio Conference Center, another place where the governing board goes, has that. I know that the copper room at Gateway has that ability. But once I get beyond those rooms, you know, I, I can think of one or two here and there, but they're not very large. And so it can be very difficult. So um, that can be a challenge. I also want to ask the question that was asked about sign language interpreters and who pays for those costs. So as an event host, MCLI is responsible for the costs of our event. And so we build those into the budget and you'll see a link with MCLI guidelines. So we built a list of quick reference guides or QRGs and one of them on how to make your events more accessible. Not going to guarantee they will be accessible, but how to make them more accessible points to the two contracts the district has, one for uh, American Sign Language interpreters and the other for captioners. So that's one of the things when we have large events like the District Day of Learning, where I know I'm going to have a couple of hundred people online, more than likely I will hire a captioner to just do things. I've had the auto captions on today to see how that looks. And it's been mostly accurate, but every so often it's it, it's not. And so as we talked earlier with some of those key terms, that's an important consideration. So you are responsible for those costs as the event host, uh, but they are reasonably priced. Um, given that, if it is um, a if it falls under the Title I ADA accommodation, that's a workplace accommodation. There's a dedicated budget for that. So if an employee is like, hey, I need an ASL interpreter for this event, it's maybe possible to, to um, go through HR and get some ADA funds there, but it has to be done through them as part of a workplace accommodation. Kind of the same thing if it has to do with the classroom, if it uh, falls under Title II, DRS has special funding set aside to deal with ASL needs for the students. So really it kind of comes down for this is um, if you're running one of those public events or whatever, then the costs would need to be baked in. Um, but it is a legal requirement. If somebody is like, I need this, that we have to be able to provide that. Um, so that could be a incidental cost that you might need to schedule for things. Um, Granted, we don't necessarily see ASL requests a lot for small form meetings. It really comes in when you get those larger scale meetings that there's there's almost always guaranteed to be somebody there, especially when you get past 100 people, that there's gonna be somebody there that's gonna benefit from having the ASL. So different groups have different thresholds when they just automatically bring them in um, for, for the event. Um, there's no hard rule for when you, when you should automatically hire somebody because it really does vary from group to group and event to event on where that threshold lives um, but a lot of groups have put in standards going if we go over 100 people we're getting the asl interpreter um, a lot of times you if you're having an event especially if it's over an hour you're going to need to actually budget for two asl interpreters because they'll need to take breaks it can be um, uh, physically exhausting to be up on stage signing for more than an hour so quite often we'll have to hire a team of two people that will alternate every 20 minutes throughout the event so they don't wear themselves out We want to thank everybody for coming today. We hope that you go out and be uh, wonderful, accessible, accommodating individuals. And we're always here to answer questions or help in any way. Um, as uh, Stephen also shared out the presentation, we wanted to share at the bottom of the presentation, the last slide, there are some links to some additional information where you can go and look into more. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you.